All right. We are going to be looking at textual criticism. Okay. If I asked you, where did we get our New Testament? What would you say? Well, you would say, I went down to the Christian bookstore and uh, gave them so many pesos or so many dollars, and they gave me my New Testament, right? That's where I got it. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, the documents that we have in our New Testament were originally written on papyrus, and then they were mm. copied. They were copied by people by hand. So um, let's say Paul is writing to, I'm sorry, is there someone speaking? Okay, let's say Paul is writing um, to the church in Corinth or to the church in Philippi. And he writes a letter. How then is that duplicated? How is it published? It was done by hand, by someone going and taking that letter that he wrote and copying it word by word onto another uh, papyrus scroll and, uh, and doing that. So he wrote the letter. When the letter arrived at the church in uh, Corinth, let's say, then someone who was interested would take that manuscript, copy it, and so now we have two copies. Now, in the case of the Colossians, in Colossians 4.16, Paul asked the congregation to have it read to the congregation in Laodicea and also to read the letter that was written to the Laodiceans. Now, we don't have that letter that was written to the Laodiceans. We don't have all the letters that Paul wrote. Excuse me. Uh, we know that he wrote four different letters to the church in Corinth, but we only have two of them. In 1 Corinthians 5, 9, he mentions... Uh, the, a, a previous letter that he had written. And then in 2 Corinthians, he mentions a severe letter that he wrote. So we would have the previous letter, our 1 Corinthians, severe letter, and then uh, 2 Corinthians. So he wrote at least four letters and uh, perhaps more. Now, let me see if I can try to illustrate this. I'll try to make a little, a little zero there, a little mark. That stands for the letter that Paul wrote and sent to the congregation. Someone then takes that and makes a copy. Uh, maybe somebody else does the same thing. And then somebody takes that one and that one. And we have multiple copies then being made until in the course of time, there are hundreds of copies of that letter. Now, the thing is that when those copies are made, mistakes enter in. So what we want is that we want it just as Paul originally wrote it. That is called the autograph. Okay, the autograph is the, the original in Paul's handwriting, although he didn't write them himself, he had secretaries. But the original one is what we want. So textual criticism is the process of getting back to what the original manuscript was, okay? Unfortunately, there were no copy machines. 
It was all done by hand. And pretty soon, uh, instead of using scrolls, they used what we call a codex, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, this process of textual criticism is called lower criticism. So lower criticism is textual criticism. Higher criticism is looking at things like author, date, uh, provenance, and all those kind of things. <laughs> Okay, let me see if I can move on here. I guess I can't. Um, let me see if I can close that out. Okay, okay, I'm gonna have to go back up and erase this, I see, because it's staying on there. Dr. Galen, do you annotate with Zoom or in the publisher somehow? Actually, this is uh, in PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, if you annotate using Zoom, then you can delete all your annotations at once. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you for letting me know that. Yes, uh, th th well, this is a blank PowerPoint page. Yes, you can still and use Zoom to annotate on top of a PowerPoint. I've done it many times. If you want me to show you later, I can help. Okay, okay, sounds good. Okay, okay. Uh, definition of textual criticism. The study of the manuscript evidence for a written work of which the original is no longer extant. That means we no longer have it with the intention to discern the original text. Uh, just a second, Dickie, can you close the door? Okay, we've, we've got to close the door here to keep out the noise. Uh, paleography is the science of ancient writing. So people who work in this area uh, have to become experts in paleography. Now let's look at the materials that the original writers and copyists used. Almost all the earlier New Testament manuscripts were either on papyrus or parchment. Papyrus was a plant that grew plentifully along the Nile River. Uh, in fact, Job 8.11 says, can papyrus grow tall where there is no marsh? So papyrus is actually mentioned uh, here that, that papyrus is uh, the reed from which uh, it was taken. Uh, these reeds grew to about 15, uh, 12 to 15 feet high. So that would be like uh, four to five meters high and about, about three inches wide. It was cut into sections of about one foot long, just about like this. Uh, the Greek word for this, this, we call it pith that's in the inside. The Greek word for that is biblos. Now they were placed on a flat surface with all the fibers running in one direction. So that it, was, it was flat. And then they took another one and put the fibers in the opposite direction. So that when you have them going in the two directions, it makes a, a very strong uh, piece of, uh, of papyrus. Papyrus was used for around 3,500 years. For that length of time, that's how long they used papyrus. Now the word biblos referred to the, the papyrus plant and then came to mean scroll or book. Uh, its diminutive form, biblion, referred to a strip of papyrus and came to refer, uh, like biblos, to the scroll and later to the codex. We'll talk about that in a minute. The plural of biblion is the word biblia. Anybody ever heard that word? 
Biblia. Okay. In, I know in Spanish and in Filipino, it means Bible. Uh, so Biblia, Bible, it's all related there. Beginning in around the first part of the fourth century, manuscripts came to be made on parchment. Parchment was more durable than papyrus and could easily be written on both sides. The process of uh, making parchment was perfected in the city of Pergamum. In fact, the word parchment comes from the word Pergamum. It was made of skins of young cattle, sheep, goats, or antelope. Now, it wasn't just leather, leather but it was a high quality of leather. It is said that it took the skins of 90 animals to make one parchment copy of the Bible. That means that it would be quite expensive to purchase even a part of the Bible or even a part of the New Testament. It's been estimated that just for Paul's 13 letters, the cost would be in U.S. dollars, 10129 So over $10,000 to buy a copy of Paul's letters. Now, vellum was the highest quality of extra thin parchment. The younger the animal, uh, the better the quality of the parchment. And in fact, uh, some was made out of unborn animals. Later deluxe editions were dyed purple and inscribed with gold and silver ink. Ordinary editions uh, used either black or brown ink, but sometimes they had decorative headings uh, in red, uh, yellow, or blue. Now, eventually the words parchment and vellum came to mean the same thing. They were used uh, synonymously. Almost all manuscripts from the fourth to the 14th centuries were made on parchment. Now in the late middle ages, paper was introduced, which was made of cotton, hemp, or flax. The pins that the scribes used uh, were made of a thin reed sharpened to a point and split in the middle. So a, a reed uh, sharpened and then uh, cut so that it, it could move apart. When, when I was a kid in elementary school, we had in our desks, we had a hole about so big, and into the hole you would put uh, a bottle of ink. The hole was called an ink well, and you would put a bottle of ink in, and then you would take a pen. Uh, it had a metal tip on it, and it was made of wood, and you would dip it into the ink, and then you would write on your paper. Now, that seems pretty primitive, and I guess it was pretty primitive. Uh, it was really neat, you know, if you, if you pressed hard, then the, the two parts would come apart and you could write double, you know, write double. And, uh, but what we had there was very similar to what the uh, original scribes had here, except it wasn't a reed, it was something made of metal. Uh, the ink that the scribes used was made of soot, you know, what's left after you have a fire, uh, with gum and water. Okay, the form of books. The papyrus roll or the scroll was made by gluing together side by side uh, sheets of, of uh, papyrus so they would make it make it go long let me let me see if i can do this okay
Well, I'm not a very good drawer. So imagine that those are all even and they were sewed together like this. It's really slow on the uptake there. Uh, what they would do then is get a stick after it had been, uh, been made here and they would wrap all of this around a stick. So it, uh, you know, if you have a big scroll, it's gonna be like this. And that was what the original manuscripts were written on. Now, both Luke and Acts would just about fill up a, a papyrus scroll. You could get like uh, 12 meters in a scroll and that would be the limit. And maybe that's why Luke tried it, uh, decided to make two documents. He could get Luke on one scroll and he could get Acts on the second scroll. Uh, and the same with, with Matthew, that would just about fill a scroll. Now the columns, the letters were written in columns about two and a half to three and a half inches wide. Uh, sometimes, though not very often, scribes would write on both sides of the papyrus. Uh, so they would write on the one side, get to the end, and then write on the other side of the scroll. Uh, we have this in Revelation 5.1. There it says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Now, imagine trying to use this as, say, our, uh, our New Testament. Try, uh, imagine try using a scroll like that. It wouldn't be very easy to do. But there was another kind of book that was developed called the Codex. Early in the second century, the codex or the leaf book came uh, to be used. It was made by taking one or more sheets of papyrus. papyrus. Uh, you could fold it in the middle and then sew it so that you have a book. Or you could just take flat sheets and sew it along the edge. It's very much like our books that we have today you could get a lot more on a codex than you could on a scroll. In fact, you could get the entire Old Testament and New Testament on a single codex. So it's easier to use a codex than a scroll. And that made it convenient then to look up specific passages in the Old or New Testament. You know, say, uh, you're like Jesus who speaks in uh, the synagogue in Nazareth, and he says to them, turn to Isaiah 61.1. Of course, they didn't have those verses like we do. But imagine them having to go and find that on these scrolls. It's going to be difficult. But it became very easy on the codex. It was also less expensive to make a codex than a scroll. The church adopted the codex very early on. And this became a visible difference between the synagogue that kept using scrolls and the church that started using codexes. So the early church was high tech. They used the latest development in uh, the form of books. And in fact, they improved it so that what was used in the church was actually a, a uh, improvement on the codexes used in the rest of the Greco-Roman world. Of the 172 manuscripts or fragments before the year AD 400, 158 of them are on codexes and 14 are in scrolls. So the codex really took over uh, uh, for the church. Okay, hey, do you have any questions or comments here?
Sir, it's uh, it's a little bit way back in the beginning. Okay. You mentioned uh, about Corinthians. Is it? Did you say? Did you say that there were like first, second, third Corinthians that Paul write? We know of four letters. Four, from the four letters. Four, but yes. only two uh, exist, right? That's right. Um, of course, we know that the Bible is inspired and in the Holy Spirit inspired writers. But because we do not have the first and second, would it affect Paul's overall? Oh, first and second, third and fourth. Would we? Would it affect Paul's overall uh, message to the Corinthians? Uh, if no. we would no 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 they got all four of those letters you know, they oh, knew they knew that's... what paul was saying it's just that we don't have them uh they were not preserved so could we say that it's god's will i think so that we haven't got the third and fourth i think okay. so thank you <laughs> uh we're, we're going to go into the canon next and we'll talk about that there but uh the holy spirit was at work in forming the canon and so we simply believe that it was god's will for us not to have those other books yeah okay uh any other questions or comments Sir. just a small question about you mentioned that the columns of writing were like three to four inches wide is that then reflected in the modern bible where we have the narrow columns and that would that be the reason why we've kept the columns in the bible um, or yeah i don't think there's any connection there okay and there are just bibles that just have one column so uh sir are you yes. gonna go over are you later gonna go over the difference between the codex sinaiticus and vaticanus um, probably not in detail. I mean, we will mention them. Uh, we'll I say a little bit about them. Okay. Yeah. I'll wait till then. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just in a few minutes, we'll talk about them a little bit. Okay. Let's look at the copying process. Copies were made word by word by hand. Manuscripts were copied in one of two ways, either an individual would get a copy of a scroll and then have a blank scroll and copy on the blank scroll what he's reading on the first scroll, or there would be several different scribes in one room and one person would read while the others wrote. Now, the, the, these uh, manuscripts would then be gone over to check for any mistakes that might have entered in. Uh, but, uh, well, mistakes did enter in. Now, at first, this would be done by those who were interested. You know, somebody uh, really wants a copy of what Paul wrote to the Philippians. So they take uh, that manuscript and they make their own manuscript. Uh, but in the ancient world, there was an industry of copy making. And in time, uh, professional scrolls, uh, professional scribes started uh, copying uh, the Christian scriptures. Now, in the Middle Ages, it was done by monks, uh, Catholic monks, you know, who were in their, their private cell doing this kind of thing. So several scribes would sit in one room, one person would read, and as they did this, errors would creep in. Uh, someone coughs and they don't hear the word right. And they put down what they think they heard, but it wasn't the right word. Some words have the same pronunciation, two different words. And so which one is it that they are going to write down? Um, so after the copies were made, a corrector would go over and uh, try to find any mistakes that could be there. Now, this is the process that they would go through. Uh, you would read it to yourself. You would retain the material in your memory. Then dictate the material again to yourself. 
and then write it down. Now, until the Middle Ages, it was customary for scribes to either sit on a stool or on the floor, put the manuscript in their lap and copy it that way, or they could stand at a bench. Uh, so don't think of them as sitting at a desk the way we would. Uh, that isn't the way it was done. And here's an ancient picture. Uh, showing a scribe copying in this way. Now, this process was used until the invention of the printing press in the 16th century. There were two kinds of Greek writing styles that uh, pertain to us here. There were actually other kinds, but for us, the first is unseals or majuscules. These are like capital letters. The word unseal means 12th, signifying the fact that you could usually get 12 letters in a column. Unseal handwriting was used until the 10th century. Recently, the term majuscules has come to be used for unseals. I'm not sure why, but uh, that has been adopted. The second kind of writing style is that of minuscules. This was a special form of cursive. You know how we write cursive today. We don't print square letters, but often we will write cursive. This was a special kind of cursive that very quickly became popular at the close of the eighth or the beginning of the ninth century. It was quicker and with it, more writing could be put on a page. It was also less expensive to produce. Okay, I'm just making a note here for myself. Uh, it should be noted here that the words did not have spaces between the words. All of them were written write together as, as if it's all, all one word. There is also very little in the way of punctuation, periods, commas, question marks, that kind of thing, very, very little. And so uh, it's easier today to tell exactly what is being written than it was in those days. There were not chapter and verse divisions uh, originally. Uh, several versions of chapter divisions were introduced beginning in the fourth century. The system of chapter divisions that we use today was developed by uh, Stephen Langdon at the beginning of the 13th century. So it goes back quite a ways. The first Greek Testament to have verse divisions was one published in 1551 developed by Robert Stephanus. Uh, and these are the verse divisions that we use today. Now, Stephanus's son reported that Stephanus did the verse divisions on a trip between Paris and Lyon. And some people have imagined Stephanus riding on a horse, you know, bouncing up and down, trying to do verse divisions as he made this trip. Well, that's probably not what his son meant. His son probably meant that in the ends, in the evening, that uh, Stephanus did this. So if you di disagree with the way a verse is divided, you know, you can't blame it on the fact that he was riding a horse when he did it, okay? Um, so was there, a, was there a basis for what he did, like which verse would the divisions did the scholars say was there a reason for the for the way he did what he did i think he probably just tried to you know use logic and reason and uh make the verses at what seemed the logical place i don't think there was any special formula yeah okay uh 
there are basically four kinds of manuscripts. Okay, so we'll talk about four kinds of manuscripts. The first we call papyri. And these are manuscripts that were written on papyrus. So these are named after the material on which they are written. So the first kind are papyrus manuscripts. They are designated by a German P with a superscript number, like P1, P2, P48, and, and so forth. The only New Testament books that are not found on a papyrus manuscript are 1st and 2nd Timothy. The second kind we call unseal or majuscule manuscripts. Now this refers to the kind of letter that is used. These are made on parchment. Okay? So the difference between the papyri manuscripts and the uncial manuscripts are the material that they're written on. They are both made with uncial letters. Okay, this can be sort of confusing. We call papyrus manuscripts papyri because of the material that they're made on. We call uncial manuscripts uncial because of the kind of lettering that is used. But both papyri and unseal manuscripts use unseal script. Okay, are you with me here? Yeah. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Okay, if you have questions about this, uh, let me know. Uh, only one unseal, uh, Codex Sinaiticus, preserves the entire New Testament. Now, unseal manuscripts are designated by a, a capital letter, like manuscript A, manuscript B, and so forth, or by a number with a zero on the front. So zero, one, zero, two, zero, 300, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, there are only 26 letters. So if you get over 26, then you've got to go to a number system. Here is a, a copy of an unseal manuscript. Notice how all the words run together. There are no divisions of words, very little in the way of punctuation. And this is uh, Matthew 1, 1 to 3 in Codex Vaticanus. Uh, manuscript O3 or Manuscript B, it's called. And you can see this is a beautiful manuscript. It would be very easy to read this by most scribes. Okay, the third kind of manuscript is the minuscule manuscript. This also refers to the kind of handwriting that is used. These were made on parchment or later on paper. So papyri and unseal all use unseal lettering. Minuscules use minuscule lettering. And this is a copy of a minuscule manuscript. <coughs> you can see it looks much more complicated than that other one that I just showed you. Here is a, another minuscule manuscript. Here's a close up of Matthew 1, 1 to 3. Now let's compare then the unseal manuscript at the top with the minuscule at the bottom. See how much easier it would be to read the one at the top than the one at the bottom? And the, <clears throat> the fourth kind of manuscript is lectionaries. 
uh, lectionaries were scripture passages used in the worship of the church. And lectionaries date from the 8th to the 16th century. And they are designated by a cursive L followed by a number. So the papyri are the oldest manuscripts. The unseals were from the 4th to the 10th centuries. The minuscules are from the 9th century and later. Let me give you a little chart here. This was from 1976, so it's quite dated. But on the left column, we have the kind of manuscripts. The middle column is the kind of script that was used. Uh, either un uh, it was unseal, and then in the right column, minuscule. So the papyri uh, in 1976, there were 88 of them. They were all 88 were in unseal script. The unseal manuscripts, there were 274. All 274 are in unseal script. The minuscule manuscripts, of which we have 2,795, all of them are in minuscule script. The lectionaries, however, are divided. 245 of them are in unseal, 1,964 in minuscule, and then there you have the totals. Now those numbers have changed over the, the years as manuscripts have been added. As of 2011, there were 127 papyri, 322 unseals, 200, uh, 2,910 minuscules, 2,453 uh, lectionaries, and then a total of 5,812. Now, as of February 2021, that total number had become 5,916. So they are continuing to add more manuscripts as time goes by. Sir. Yes. Uh, this is great. Uh, I just like to ask, where would where are they kept? I mean, the archives, the museum, mostly. Uh, they're kept all over. All over the world. Yes, um, and uh, the British Museum has a lot of the more important manuscripts, but some are in Russia, some are in Germany, some are in the United States. Um, oh. And in fact, some manuscripts, part of it is in one country and part of it's in another. So yeah, yeah, some are, okay. in, some are at universities. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they can be consulted by scholars to see the actual. Yes, and only by scholars. Yeah, scholars. They, they will not let you or me consult them. Yeah. Right, right. Um, the oldest manuscript that we have is that of P52, generally dated around AD 125. Uh, We'll, we'll talk about this one a little more later. Uh, we should also note that there are other kinds of evidence besides Greek manuscripts. There are versions, and this is translations uh, into other languages, most notably Latin, Syriac, and Coptic. And then the final category of other evidence would be patristic citations. And these are citations from the church fathers. Uh, the church fathers will quote a verse. And uh, by seeing the verse as they quote it, you can tell what his manuscript said. And it's been said that if all the Greek manuscripts were destroyed, we could put together the entire New Testament simply from the patristic citations. That is how much they quoted. In times of economic depression, depression, parchment was reused. The older script was scraped or washed off 
and new was written over it. A book like this is called a palimpsest. Uh, so by using ultraviolet lamps, they are able to go back, scrape off the what's been written on top of it and get back to the original manuscript. Uh, there, today we have 68 palimpsests of the 322 unseals. Now, sometimes scribes wrote notes at the end of their books. Uh, one person, one scribe wrote, as the traveler rejoices to see their home country, so also is the end of a book to those who toil. One says, the end of the book, thanks be to God. He must have had a, a hard time doing that. Uh, another one says, whoever says, God bless the soul of the scribe, God will bless his soul. And another one says, mercy be to him who wrote, O Lord, wisdom to those who read, grace to those who hear, salvation to those who own. Amen. Uh, at times, the scribes would put dates or locations or who they were at the end of the manuscript. So it was important in our being able to date the manuscripts. There were also at times conversational jottings that were written in the, the uh, margins of manuscripts. Because, you know, monks uh, often took a, a, a vow of silence. So they couldn't talk to one another but they could write. And from a ninth century Latin manuscript, these are marginal comments uh, that were written in Irish. It says, it is cold today. It is natural, it is winter. This lamp gives bad light. It is time for us to begin to do some work. Well, this vellum is certainly heavy. Well, I call this vellum thin. I feel quite dull today. I don't know what is wrong with me. Just a little fascinating thing of what these scribes would write in, in the margins. In Hebrews 1.3, uh, the original of Codex Vaticanus had the word phanerone, meaning manifesting. A corrector changed it to what is a better reading which is pharaoh, meaning upholding or carrying along. So you got the original, a copyist comes along and then changes it to what is a better reading. And then another copyist changed it back and wrote in the margin, most ignorant and wicked man, leave the original reading alone. Do not change it. All right. Um, here is a little uh, graphic that will sort of summarize what we have looked at here. Uh, at the top, we have uh, the material. And we have at the left, papyrus going uh, to about the fifth century, and then vellum or parchment and then way at the right paper. That was the material that it was made on. For the pen, it started off with a reed, but then they later adopted the quill, that is a feather. On the book form, it started out as the scroll on the left side, and then uh, changed to the codex, the book form. And then the handwriting, is unseal at the beginning, at the in the bottom there, and it changes to the minuscule on the right. So in this one graphic here, you have the different ways uh, that uh, the manuscripts changed over time. All right, uh, we will take a 10 minute break and have a good one, get yourself some coffee, and we will see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Ma non si può dire nessuno, se non è la... O vice. Ma non vi ha fatto il Ma non vi ha fatto il chai. Ma non vi ha fatto il chai. Ma non vi a Kalima se fulu le mansinga o mo mansinga le meo le mission fan mo va kuwa les pola ide la ma wo va kuwa anga mo no wo really singa ku mo ma ko skuwa yo le so fu o yo le so o yo lai mo yo a yo yo lai de mo wo really singa ku mo ve so fu so na la wa u up to il massimo è che non si può fare un massimo di massimo di massimo di massimo di massimo di massimo di massimo Yeah, okay, it's all right. It's all right. I'm, I don't know what to take a while of you, but it's up to you. I'm not going to go to my room. Okay. That's great for more color. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've been out Yeah. I'll walk you out. Yeah. 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 All right, let us come back. All right, let me go ahead and do the screen share. And I'll hook up the other monitor.
All right. All right, we are going to look at the major manuscripts. Somebody was asking about a couple of them. In terms of the papyri, uh, some of the major uh, manuscripts would be these. P4, 64, and 67. These may all be from the same uh, manuscript originally. They are from the mid to the late 200s. P11 uh, is, uh, was the first papyrus manuscript ever published in modern times by Count Tichendorf. P45 is from the early 200s. It's one of the largest gospel papyri that we have. P46 is 86 leaves of the Pauline epistles from around 200. And P52, uh, we mentioned this earlier as being the earliest manuscript that we have, dating from around 125. And uh, about P52, Metzger and Ehrman say, although the extent of the verses preserved is so slight, that it's only a very small fragment. In one respect, this tiny scrap of papyrus possesses quite as much evidential value as would the complete codex. Just as Robinson Crusoe, seeing but a single footprint in the sand, concluded that another human being with two feet was present on the island with him. So P52 proves the existence and use of the fourth gospel during the first half of the second century in a provincial town along the Nile. Excuse me just a second while I make a note. Far removed from its traditional place of composition, Ephesus in Asia Minor, had this little fragment been known during the middle of the past or the 19th century, that school of New Testament criticism, which was inspired by the brilliant Tubingen professor Ferdinand Christian Bauer, could not have argued that the fourth gospel was not composed until about the year 160. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Robinson Crusoe. It's a, a work of literature. It's about a man who is shipwrecked on an island out in the Pacific, and he thinks he's by himself, but he discovers footprints. What do those footprints tell him? Not just that there are feet there, but there's a whole person there. In the same way, this little tiny fragment from a far off place in Egypt tells us that there was this entire manuscript down there and it was at a very early date, perhaps as much as within 35 years of the time it was originally written by the Apostle John. So that's P52. Uh, we also have P66 uh, from around the year 200. It contains the Gospels. And P75 from the late 100s to the early 200s, it's the earliest known manuscript of the Gospel of Luke. So these would be major papyri manuscripts. On seals, I'm only going to mention three. We have Codex, Sin Codex Sinaiticus. It's designated by Aleph, the Hebrew first letter, or O1. There's Codex Alexandrinus, A or O2, and Codex Vaticanus, B or O3. Codex Sinaiticus was uh, discovered in a monastery at the base of Mount Sinai back in the 1800s. Uh, by a man by the name of Count Tichendorf. 
they were using it in their stove to keep warm. They were burning the manuscript and he rescued the manuscript. Uh, it was sent to Russia and then from there, uh, the British bought it and it's in the British Museum. Uh, Codex Alexandrinus uh, also is an important manuscript from the 400s and Codex Vaticanus uh, at one time had the complete Old Testament and New Testament, uh, but it's now missing several books. It's been at the Vatican for at least since the 1400s. Okay, so these are the major manuscripts in papyri and unsealed. Uh, we want to talk about manuscript families. Let me see if I... Okay, remember the little drawing that I made at the beginning uh, about how a manuscript would be copied and then uh, some would be copied from it and then others from it and others from it. And there may be another group going back to an original copy and that others copied from it and, and so forth. Uh, if one of those original copies had a lot of mistakes in it, uh, then that's going to affect the entire uh, manuscripts that were copied from it. And maybe the other original copy did not contain those errors. And so those manuscripts would not have the errors that the, the other one had. Uh, so you can isolate families of manuscripts, some that have similar readings, similar errors that have been copied from the ones before it. And of those, they have isolated three or four families. Uh, there's the Alexandrian or the neutral family. And uh, these come from Egypt and they are generally considered to be the best manuscripts. They had perfected the art of copying in uh, Alexandria and they did it very carefully, very precisely. The next family there is the Western family. And this also it goes back to a very ancient source, but there are a lot of peculiarities of it. In fact, the, the Western uh, family in Acts is about 10% longer than the Alexandrian. So it seems like that things were added there. The Byzantine or Syrian family uh, is later. And uh, there are a lot of them. A lot of them are beautiful manuscripts. This, the reading is very smooth, uh, but they are probably not the most original of the families. Some people say they see a Caesarean family in the gospels, uh, but that is debated. Most scholars believe that the best family here is the Alexandrian. If you take the top scholars in textual criticism. Now, there are those who say that the Byzantine is the most accurate. Um, there are more of them. So if you're going to go by the number of manuscripts, then you're going to go for the Byzantine. But just the number of manuscripts is uh, not really a, a good basis for choosing which is the most accurate. So it's quality, not quantity. And there is a Facebook group called NT Textual Criticism. And there are a lot of people on there that are King James only and uh, they really like the Byzantine, but that would be rejected by the uh, majority of textual scholars. Uh, 
Uh, one person has tried to make a map here of where the different families come from. Uh, this is pretty much rejected nowadays, uh, recently in textual criticism, because it's so mixed up. You know, if a scribe has, a, has two manuscripts, say one is Byzantine and one is Alexandrian, and he takes from both, then what do you call the one that he's making? It's going to be a mixture of them. And so we probably can't divide it down into uh, geographical areas like that. Now, how do we choose the best manuscripts? Uh, at the level of external evidence here, we would go with the Alexandrian family, the Alexandrian text. Uh, realizing that there are some places where the others would be preferred, but primarily it would be the Alexandrian. We also would need to take into account the lateness and the inferiority of the Byzantine text. Now, the important thing for us is that when manuscripts were copied, errors crept in. And they are of two different kinds. One is unintentional changes, mistaking one letter for another. For example, in 2 Peter 2.13, is the word agapais, meaning love feast from agape, or is it apatais, meaning dissipation or deceptions? If you go to the English translations, uh, some of them go with agapais, some go with apatais. So there's a, uh, it's not uniform there. Uh, there's disagreement on which is the original. There's the faulty use of abbreviations. There came to be 15 standard abbreviations that were used in the New Testament manuscripts. They are called the nomina sacra. But one scribe may make his own set of abbreviations and another scribe doesn't recognize uh, what it was and there can, that can cause an error. Uh, this is a manuscript, uh, Codex G from the ninth century now notice that it is an interlinear. It has the Greek text, but right above each word is the Latin word. Now at the bottom of the page, there is a, uh, a little note there, if you can notice that on the page. And this is what it says. To come to Rome, to come to Rome, much of trub trouble, little of profit. The thing thou seekest here, if thou bring it not with thee, thou findest not. Hey, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. There are people who go all over the world trying to find happiness, trying to find something that's going to make them happy. But if they don't take it with them, they're not going to find it wherever they go. Great folly, great madness, great ruin of sense, great insanity, since thou hast set out for death, that thou should be in disobedience to the Son of Mary. That, that's just a, a little note that a scribe put at the bottom of that page. Now, here we have a close-up of some abbreviations. In the top, ho theos, uh, that's a theta and then an S, or it looks like a C. That's an abbreviation for God, ho theos. <coughs> the bottom one is anthropon, the word for man. And notice both of those have a line over the top that shows it's an abbreviation. And over anthropon, we have homonym, which is the Latin for man. So the first word is the word for God from 1 Corinthians uh, 2.9. Uh, 
The second is the word for man from verse 11. So abbreviations can be confusing. There's also the skipping of lines. You've probably done that yourself, right? When you've copied from one thing to another, you've skipped lines. Uh, repeating, putting in something twice. Omission, skipping over something. We call that haplography. That's uh, repeating is dittography. Omission is hap haplography. And then there are errors of the ear. That is, you, you hear what is said, but you don't interpret it right. Uh, for example, a uh, long time ago, we used to sing a chorus that went, I believe God, I believe God, it shall be done even as he said. Trust and obey, believe him and say, I believe, I believe God. Yeah. Nice chorus. But instead of trust and obey, believe him and say, what if it was trust and obey, believe him and say? Trust and obey, believe him and say, okay? Uh, hey, they're both right, right? That's what was said. So oh my. <laughs> this, this, this would be an error of the ear. Okay, now I'm going to play a video for you. I'm going to have to stop the screen share for a minute and restart it. And um, on this, oh, well, let me start it again, just, just for one here. Okay, um, this is a, a conversation, although it never really happened, but uh, it illustrates errors of the year. It is U.S. President George W. Bush. He's speaking with Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. When she says who, who is the leader of China, he hears who. When she says, yes, sir, he hears Yasser, as in Yasser Arafat. And when she says Kofi, Kofi Annan, the head of the United Nations, he hears coffee. Okay? So now let me stop the screen share and I'm going to have to restart it. All right, let's see if we can make this go here. Yeah. Mr. President, Condoleezza Rice here to see you. Good, send her in. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. President. Oh, Condoleezza, nice to see you. What's happening? Well, Mr. President, I have the report here about the new leader in China. Great, Condi, lay it on me. Mr. President, who is the new leader of China? Well, that's what I want to know. Well, that's what I'm telling you, Mr. President. Well, that's what I'm asking you, Condi. Who is the new leader of China? Yes. I mean the feller's name. Q. The guy in China. Q. The new leader of China. Q. The Chinaman. Q is leading China, Mr. President. What are you asking me for? I'm telling you, Q is leading China. Well, I'm asking you, Condi, who is leading China? That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Will you or will you not tell me the name of the new leader of China? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Arafat is in China. I thought he was in the Middle East. That's correct, sir. Then who's in China? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is in China? No, sir. Then who is? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. Connie, you're starting to me off now, and it's not because you're black neither. I need to know the name of the new leader of China, so I want you to get me the Secretary General of the United Nations on the phone. Coffee, NN? No, thanks. And Condi, call me George. Stop with that Ebonics crap. You want coffee? No. You don't want coffee? No, but now you mention it, I could use a glass of milk. And then get me the UN. Yes, sir. Not yes, sir. The guy at the United Nations. Coffee. Milk. 
Will you please make that call? And call who? Well, who's the guy at the UN? No, who is the guy in China? Will you stay out of China? Yes, sir. And stay out of the Middle East. Just get me the guy at the UN. Coffee. All right, with cream and two sugars. Now get on the phone. Hello, Rice here. Rice, good idea. And get a couple of egg rolls, Condi. Maybe we should send some to the guy in China and the Middle East. Can you get Chinese food in the Middle East? I don't know. That was a classic. Okay. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> okay. That is errors of the ear. Um, now, here are some biblical examples. Hold on a second, because I have lost you. Sir, while well, you're finding us again, okay, here what's we the go. fancy word for errors of the ear again? Uh, it's just errors of the year. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Uh, in Romans 5.1, should the word be echomen or should it be echomen? <laughs> they sound almost exactly alike. In fact, they probably did sound exactly alike. So if Paul is, or the, the scribe is uh, writing and he hears this, which is he going to write down? Echo men, let us have, or echo men, we have. And, you know, if you look at the translations, you'll see that it's divided between them. In Koine Greek, several letters and diphthongs were pronounced alike. E, I, U, U. E I O I U I and long E all were pronounced like long E. Because of that, very often the words for us, we, hey mace, and you, who mace, got mixed up. For example, in 1 John 1 4, did John say, We write this to make our joy complete or your joy complete? It depends on whether it's hemon or humon, which would have been pronounced the same way at that time. So errors of the ear. Um, errors of memory. Uh, remembering the sequence of words. You read it, you remember it, you write it down, and sometimes you get the sequence off. And then there are errors of judgment. Uh, for example, putting marginal notes into the uh, body of the New Testament itself. Probably in John 5, 3b to 4, that passage about the angel stirring the waters probably was originally a, a marginal note that got put in to the actual text. The worst example that I know of of errors of judgment is in Luke 3, 23 to 38. It was a two-column manuscript, so two columns on a page, but the scribe wrote it as if it were one column. Okay, this is the genealogy of Christ. In Luke's genealogy, God was the son of Aram, and Pharisees was the father of all mankind. That's Codex 109 from the 14th century. Uh, I, you would think he would catch that, you know, uh, but he didn't. Uh, and then we have a faulty division of words. Since there was no separation between the words, one might divide the words at the wrong place when it came time to like put them into a minuscule manuscript. An example, what does this say? What does this say? 
I, I saw, saw abundance. Abund- abundance on the table. Abundance on the table. Okay. I saw abundance on the table. Could it say anything else? Yes, I saw a bun dance on the table. Okay, I saw a bun, bun dance, dance on the table. Table. Okay, which is it? Well, you can't tell. You have to take it from context, right? <laughs> okay. Um, what does it this? It could also be is a wab and then it's on the table and then you're really stuck, right? That's right. That's you don't, right. If you don't split it right from the beginning, you're going to be so stuck. That's right. Okay. Uh, trying to get it to go to the next page. Okay. What does this say? God is no lawyer. God is nowhere. nowhere. Okay, can you say anything else? God is now here. 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 So if you're a Christian, it's God is now here. If you're an atheist, God is nowhere. Okay. So it, it depends on your worldview now. That's right. That's right. So um, the the way words are divided can also be a factor. I will just say, I, I'm trying to learn Thai and they do their writing system this way. And it is so hard for those of us who are used to spaces to mm-hmm. try to insert those in the proper place. It's really yes. hard, but they would have been experts at it back in the day. They would have been really good at it. Uh-huh. We were in, we were in Bangkok once and we were next, we were in our car next to a van. And this van had a word on the side. I wanted to take a picture of this long word, but I couldn't get it all in my camera. It went off the left and off to the right, you know? It's because it's a Huge sentence, it's word. not a word. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess I know that now. Because <laughs> Thai works the same way, so like, you see this long old thing and they don't really use punctuation either. You see this long old thing and you have to piece out where it goes. It's for those that aren't used to that, it's really hard, but they train kids in school from really young ages in these cultures to be able to deal with it. Mm. So the scribes would have been good at it. For okay. those of us that don't do it, we would have would have not passed the test, but anyway. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, an example from the from the scripture, First uh, Timothy three sixteen. Uh, is it homo homologumenos mega, or is it homologumenos mega? Is it three words? In other words, homologumen hos mega, which means we acknowledge how great, and this is what the EF, ESV takes it as, we in a great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Or is it homo logumenos, mega, confessedly great? And that's the way the NIV takes it. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. Does it affect the meaning, then, sir? Uh, yes, it would. It would oh, slightly. It would slightly. slightly. Uh huh. But not significantly. Not, not significantly. in this example. Not in yeah. this example. But I could, I could first see situations where it would. It, it's if possible. You're not a yeah. Right. Um, homologumen, we confess. Hos is as. Mega is great. We confess as great, or um, homologumenos is uh, an adverb 
Um, confessedly, confessedly, great, maybe great it's a uh, different great. Yeah. Um, in Mark 10 40, the NIV, NIV translates it. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. So is it al hois het toi must die? It is for those for whom it has been prepared or is it uh, let me see the other one here. Alois hetoi must die. It has been prepared for others. Either of those are possible. So those kinds of decisions have to be made. Now, these are all unintentional changes that we're talking about. There were mm. some intentional changes supposed corrections of misspellings. So, you know, a scribe comes along something that seems to be misspelled, but maybe it was intended to be that way, but he changes it. You know, the best scribe is one who doesn't think. All he does is copy what's there. You know, he is a copy machine. Just like a machine. The ones that get us in trouble are the ones that think. Uh, grammatical corrections to make them more literary. Uh, in Revelation 1.4, uh, the wrong case is used. At least that was probably the judgment of a scribe, and they changed it to what would normally be the right case, although I think maybe originally uh, the person who wrote that, which would be John, uh, wanted it the way he wrote it. Changes to remove historical difficulties. Uh, harmonizing, like things like the Lord's Prayer in Matthew and in Luke. So uh, we have one version in Matthew, another in Luke, and some try to harmonize those. And then we have also other harmonistic corruptions. Conflations of readings. Uh, conflation means putting together. So scribes were very hesitant to take anything out. They would be more likely to put things in that they see in different manuscripts. Uh, for example, in Luke 24, 53, uh, some manuscripts say continuing in the temple, blessing God. And other ones say continually in the temple, praising God. And then some put the two together and say continually in the temple, blessing and praising God. So that would be a conflation of two different readings. So you don't want to drop one out. So you add both. And then doctrinal alterations. In 1 John 5, 7, it says there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and those three are one. That is in the King James Version, but it was not in the original manuscripts. And uh, that would be a, an example of a doctrinal change. Someone put that in there as a clear teaching about the Trinity, although it is not original. Um, Okay. Question, please. Uh, yes, Elise. So do you think that's, that's the problem we are struggling with now? Is it? Because uh, of the, of the, of the wordings, the, the changes, all these things. Because as you mentioned now, other scribes put their intention, intentional, and others put their <coughs> unintentional. And that my question is, isn't that the, the problem that we Christians are facing now, trying to interpret the scripture in the right way? Okay, I don't think that that, that is a major problem because through textual criticism, 
we can discover quite accurately what the original readings were. Most of the modern versions use the better and older manuscripts. So um, it, I, I don't think that that is a major issue today. Now, there are some passages where it's very difficult to tell what was original, but none of those passages uh, determine our doctrine. Uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians 13, I think it's verse 3, where he says, if I uh, offer my body to be burned, but have not love, I am nothing. And is it to be burned? Or the other reading would be that I may boast. There's only one letter difference in those words, that I may be burned or that I may, be, that I may boast. Which is it? And it is really hard. Uh, we don't know for sure which it is. The evidence is balanced out so well. But our, no doctrine hinges on that. So we may not be sure which one was original, but we know one of them was original. And we know the point that Paul is making. Without love, you're nothing. Okay, that's the point. Um, so, and we're going to point out here in a little bit that no major doctrine depends upon which reading of a manuscript is right. Okay, so if, if you take a modern version, NIV, ESV, NLT, you know, one of these, uh, it is going to really give you quite accurate uh, readings from the text. There may Sir? be some, some disagreement, but not a lot. Yes. That's good to hear from a professor and a scholar because all of these errors, uh, a layman would probably have doubts already if, if, you're, if you have not said that or if we have not we will not be dealing more with textual criticism. It's good to know that uh -huh. despite of the errors, we can still trust the reliability of the New Testament manuscripts and it does not affect the major doctrines of what we, what we believe. That's right. Be right. Because that, that is what these errors are what sometimes non-believers would throw at us. You know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, th that, that's their like, criticism of the New Testament. But it's good right. to hear from you. Yes, and uh, we're going to go into this a little, in a little more detail in a few minutes, okay? Um, let us look at the kinds of evidence, okay? We, we, are, we are seeing a, a variant in a text, in a verse. Uh, so should it be this one or should it be that one? How do we decide? When we look at the evidence, and there are two kinds of evidence, the first is internal evidence. Internal evidence looks at the probability of what the author would write, knowing his other writings, his theology, and his circumstances. So is this something that Paul would write, knowing about Paul? Is that something? Or is it something that we could not imagine him writing? Um, or the way scribes copy, which is the most likely that they would have copied? So these are internal questions. The external evidence looks at the manuscripts that are available, their age, their quality, their genealogy, and so forth, and see which reading the best manuscripts give. So two kinds of evidence, internal, and external. Internal, what would the author have written from what we know of him? External, look at the manuscripts. Now, um, 
There are four approaches to textual criticism that I want to share with you. One is called the classical method. And this depends heavily on the families, the genealogical approach. So this puts a great emphasis on, you know, was it from an Alexandrian family or Western or Byzantine? Uh, the great pioneers of textual criticism, Westcott and Hort, uh, really use this method a lot. The second is reasoned eclecticism. This attempts to look at all the evidence, internal, external, the genealogies, the families, and on the basis of all of this, try to come up with the best, uh, the best alternative, the best variant here. So it's a balanced approach. There is rigorous eclecticism. And this method relies almost entirely on internal evidence and basically ignores the manuscripts. And the fourth method is called the majority text method. Um, this method basically counts the number of manuscripts that have a certain reading. However, you could count a thousand manuscripts that have a bad reading and maybe the right reading is only in a few. So, like I said before, it's quality, not quantity, that is the most important thing. Uh, which of these approaches do you think would be the best? Number two. All right, that's right, number two. The one that tries to take in all the evidence and uh, consider it all, take a balanced approach, and then come up with your, your answer. Now, a fifth method has um, recently been offered here. It's it's called the coherence-based genealogical method. And it was developed by the Institute for New Testament Textual Research in Munster, Germany. It's quite technical and relies upon computers to determine the best readings. The 28th edition of Nestle and the fifth edition of the UBS use it in the general epistles. So how do we decide what the original was? Well, you know, it's, as, as much an art as it is a science. Uh, one person has said that teaching a person to be a textual critic is like teaching a person to be a poet. It takes good common sense as well as following a good procedure. Okay, uh, we'll stop there and we will take up here next time. So we will see you then. Are, are there any questions or comments before we sign off here uh, yes sir yes well i'm just wondering if there will be essay questions in the midterm uh yes there will okay thank you okay. uh-huh all right the lord bless you and we will see you on friday morning take care thank you sir Good thank, night. You, sir. thank you thank you, thank you sir thank you sir, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, dr highland